Hello, and a warm welcome to you. I'm pleased to take you along today on an exciting journey into the world of collective intelligence and, yes, bees. Well, without doubt, bees are incredible little insects. With uh, their pollinating job, they pollinate the vast majority of all our fruits and vegetables that we consume on a daily business, and they secure our food supply. Without bees and other pollinating insects, we would have a major problem. But bees may be of importance to us on a different field as well, namely as role models. Why? Well, a beehive is a well-structured, socially complex and very productive organization. Thousands upon thousands of bees work together in a colony and work very, very efficiently. In industrial automation, we strive for exactly that greater efficiency. We're trying to keep pace with the ever-developing uh, technologies of our times. So the question is, is the success story of bees transferable to our industrial environment? Is collective intelligence a solution for our IoT world? What can we learn from bees? This is what we try to find out in today's session. And I'm very happy to welcome a true expert in this field. Professor Dr. Landgraf is joining us from Berlin today. He is a professor at the Free University of Berlin, and he's uh, working in the field of artificial intelligence and collective intelligence, and has been researching bees for years. So, hello, Tim. Good to see you. Great to have you here today. Hi, Iris. How are you doing? I'm very, very good. good. <laughs> Thanks for the invitation. You're welcome. I'm very excited about the presentation. But there's one more thing that I would like to add on the organizational side. If you have any questions or feedback throughout the session, we would like to let us know. Just use the chat function and uh, we'll come back to your questions at the end of the session. So enough words for me now. Um, enjoy the session and Tim, the stage is yours. Thank you. I'm going to share my slides uh, and I hope you can see them. So today I'm going to talk about um, honeybees and uh, other um, swarms that uh, my lab and, and I are um, researching since a couple of uh, years already. I think uh, in bees I'm working well, almost 20 years combining machine learning and robotics uh, with the questions that we still have in, in honeybees. But let me start um, just zooming out and uh, quickly redefining um, what swarms are. Um, you have probably all seen these beautiful displays of um, starling flocks and showing these beautiful patterns. Um, <clears throat> and it's always been a research question, how can tens of thousands or even more um, individuals generate these uh, interesting patterns? And uh, research has uh, come up with um, very simple rules that are um, implemented in each one of these uh, individual birds. Um, and these rules are very simple. Um, so you actually just need three uh, or two. Um, the, the middle rule here isn't really necessary, but let me explain all of them. So if you are uh, one of those birds in here and your nearest neighbor is within this red repulsion zone, then you are repelled. Right? You, you're trying to increase the distance. The opposite happens when your nearest neighbor is in the green zone. Um, so pretty far away, you are attracted to that someone and sometimes uh, mathem uh, mathematicians model this behavior with this uh, alignment rule, excuse me, <coughs> when um, your nearest neighbor is in such an intermediate distance, you or both actually are trying to align their body axis. And that is sufficient to produce um, simulated swarms that show the exact same um, patterns in simulation. <clears throat> now, um, this is, although it's a very um, remarkable uh, display and very interesting 
pattern. <coughs> it's very simple. Excuse me. Mm. So today I'm going <clears> to <throat> go a little bit into the complexity of these social complex systems. And I'm going to start with uh, looking at ourselves, at humans. <coughs> Sorry. These could be, um, uh, you know, 3D generated pictures, but um, you still understand that uh, we are all very different. Yeah. So just looking at these um, um, data sets here, um, there are different factors that influence just the way our face looks. Uh, it's age, it's skin color, it's, I don't know, hair color, it's uh, whether we wear glasses and so on. And But each of these factors also <clears throat> influence how we interact with each other, how we behave. Yeah. So as a small kid, we can do um, some things that we can't when we are old and vice versa. And I don't know, as a, as a um, white um, old male, we are uh, sometimes more privileged than, um, um, I don't know, colored people or so, yeah? <coughs> now, um, this is something, this is uh, something that uh, we subsume under diversity, right? So all the swarms do not employ the same rules on the individual level. They are not the same rules because the body that implements this motion or any behavior is a little different. Yeah? Now, the second factor is that <clears throat> although it seems to be a spatially coherent structure, something that may even um, you know, follow global uh, rules, they cannot be implemented on the global level. They are implemented uh, on, on the uh, interaction level between individuals, so we don't have any centralized control. <coughs> <coughs> Sorry. Um, I mean, obviously, in technical systems, we could have, but uh, when we look at biological systems, we can't have any of these um, centralized control architectures. It's basically only communicating, so sensing on the one hand from nearest neighbors and also displaying actions, communicative actions, behavior that others in my social proximity can observe. And so we, we, uh, we see clusters of, of local computation, let's say, from a computational point of view. And since there's no such thing as a program that tells us what on the global, on the group, group level, what kind of pattern or task or so should be fulfilled, um, everything is on the local individual level. Something very interesting is happening. Uh, we call it emergence. So the properties on the group level somehow emerge from the many, many interactions of the individuals. And we don't know from just looking at those rules what are the patterns going to look like on the group level. Yeah? And that's very interesting because it's very compressed. <coughs> we can't just read the code and see what, what we'll get out of this. We either have to simulate it or have to have a, I don't know, a super a computer that uh, tells us what, what this will look like. Now, um, the third dimension of this is that each of these individuals isn't just a, a dot and, and a motion vector, just uh, like in simulation. It actually has a brain. So in all biological social groups, these brains you know, may be small or may be big, but they will be brains, and brains can learn. So... <clears throat> Um, each of these interactions will be a little plastic. Yeah? Sometimes the interactions will look like this, but because of the history of interactions, the future of interactions will likely look a little different. Yeah? If we uh, take out one of those brains, the whole group will have to and will adapt to the new situation. And that's also 
a powerful tool in biological swarms. Yeah, so it's not just um, a homogeneous uh, mass of copies of copies. They are a little different. They are adaptive. And through the application of the interaction rules that they have, they may be very simple. Um, we see an emergent um, creation of um, yeah, group level um, patterns of behavior. Um, the, uh, there are some more aspects that I want to stress here because um, we can always take these ideas and um, put them as a pattern on our technical systems. Yeah? For example, um, we as humans and pretty much all animals um, that live in groups have evolved communication. Communication is basically signs um, and verbal language is something that uh, you know we employ every day, but doesn't really have to be verbal like these two young ladies here waving at the camera, <clears throat> that is something that only we can understand because uh, we were trained to understand it. Yeah? So the meaning, the underlying meaning of this uh, hand wave um, to say hello or goodbye or <clears throat> I'm, I don't know, friendly, um, the underlying meaning uh, is understood in the group and so we can use these signs to communicate. Now, interestingly, just looking at that, by the way, AI generated uh, image here, uh, there are many details that even communicate more, um, such like the age, for example, yeah, or that uh, holding hands probably means that they are friends or helping each other, yeah. Uh, they are not wearing any wedding ring, so that may give away some more information, yeah. So in, in natural swarms, the way individuals communicate between each other is the result of some evolutionary optimization, yes, but also, depending on the cognitive capacity of the individuals, um, can be much broader, can be much more subtle, yeah? Okay. Now, um, the, the interesting um, part of groups is really the way how they connect. And it's very similar to what we do every day. We are a very social animal, right? So we meet friends, talk with them. We meet coworkers uh, or give talks over, over teams, you know. Uh, we meet other friends uh, and play sports. <laughs> so the interaction structure that we follow in our, our everyday lives is basically the very complex time varying social network. And <clears throat> to make it even more complex, if you, if you think about it, everything is a complex system, a network system with pieces interacting, sharing information and so on. But yes, of course, this is much too complex. We need um, a model system and that's my, my uh, path back to the bees and that's what I do in Berlin. We have developed a system that um, looks like this. Um, when we ran it on, on image recordings, it's basically observing small colonies, observing what they do, who is doing um, certain behaviors, where in the nest. <clears throat> so we can basically determine everything that's visible um, to then, in the end, obtain a social network um, inside the computer that we then can use. And the bees are a very, very fine modeling system because they show all the different things that we do as humans and our technical systems may be doing in the future in this small box, really. I mean, this um, my computer display is like this, and that's basically the size of the colony, and we can observe them over weeks and weeks and weeks, overlapping generations, you know, starting their lives, ending their lives, and in the middle, doing whatever they do. The communication between bees isn't just chemical. Uh, they have 
a lot of things that, that go on and bees are like the brain, spatially organized. So we have different regions in the colony that have different functions for the colony. For example, the brood care or the dance floor, uh, it's called like that because the communication dances take place there, um, or the storage areas, yeah? So it's, it's, and so, and that's why I, I always think of the brain, uh, the, the honeybee colony as a brain made out of brains. Now, how do they communicate? Mm, we see a lot of different vibratory behaviors, like, for example, this, uh, this is a so-called tremble dance. A forager comes in and can't find anyone to unload the crop to. So that's basically saying, hey, come here, I have something. Yeah. Um, or behaviors like this. Um, that is a little hardly visible. I hope you can all see it. It's a waggle dance showing the others uh, where to find food. Then we have, um, what is even that? Ah, yeah, that's something that we are not re really sure about what that means. So it's a up and down uh, movement of the abdomen. And then, of course, we have things like ventilation behaviors where bees are just cooling the hive, which doesn't really directly um, communicate information. But indirectly, if I would be a bee that is also supposed to be cooling, but I know, OK, here's uh, someone who already cools the hive, so I don't have to do it. Um, local information is being spread out anyway. Yeah. Now, and there are other things like this shaking behavior. So that bee jumps on another bee and, and shakes her to wake her up to uh, take part in foraging efforts. Yeah? And so there's, there's some, I don't know, a vast number of these small one-to-one -one or one-to-few uh, communication channels. And each one, and it, it's not like typing a short, uh, short message to your friend, but it has something like that, right? So it's a very dense community and a lot of information is being processed just like in the brain where neurons connect to other neurons um, integrate information that they receive by either going out themselves or you know listening to other bees in the in the colony and then at some point giving out some information just like neurons do okay now there, there are different things that we can do with AI and robotics. And I think these are great ways to kind of show some parallels to the technical world. Um, in our technical world, we do have a lot of groups and swarms. It's not just the technical systems themselves, like in IoT. Uh, sometimes it's really the markets that we enter, that we want to enter, uh, or um, systems and humans intertwined as hybrid systems. And so I'm gonna go into detail about all these different factors escalating a little bit, um, starting with how can AI, just by observing the swarm system, help us understand the state of the system? There's no feedback yet. There's no no understanding of the, of the swarm directly. Um, and so that's, for example, done in our project here. Um, no, it doesn't play. Okay, let me just continue that. By detecting honeybee dances. Um, so a bee would come in and would dance, and we understand exactly what this dance means. Um, we just read it make, uh, like automatically with the, with the software, decode it with respect to gravity, put put it on the map and we know exactly, okay, that forager was probably forging in this garden here. Yeah, so we can observe parts of the, of the collective decoding parts of their communication that wasn't really supposed for us, uh, to be understood by us, but with, you know, within their system, but we can use AI to read out information, put it on the map in this case and understand where are these bees forging? Now, this has been done a, uh, you know, a couple of times already. Uh, a few examples here, for example, include uh, predictive maintenance. Like you have uh, one of those wind turbines. Um, you can, for example, measure the temperature of the, of the uh, uh, yeah, 
I forgot the word uh, of the. <laughs> uh, anyway, so the thing the thing that actually turns and may get hot because it's not looped or whatever. And by reading out um, temperature patterns, maybe the slope of the increase, for example, we can predict. Wait, there's something uh, about to happen. Let's uh, send an engineer. Yeah. So this isn't a directly automated feedback loop that's closed. Obviously, there's a human involved. And obviously, that's good for, for many of these cases. Um, but that's a big deal, although it's not a new thing. No? Another example is, uh, for example, your iPhone or your Android phone that evaluates constantly your accelerometer data and may be able to uh, detect whether you have been in a crash and send uh, an emergency call out, um, which would be an automated um, feedback to someone else. That's true. Um, or, you know, you yourself tracking yourself in, in the sleep, uh, optimizing your, I don't know, bioparameters, for example. Yeah. So this is simple. We shouldn't be talking too much about this. This is just to start. Um, we are, we are all part uh, of a more complex system. We are tracking or we are detecting stuff that, that that's happening in there. But really what we really want to do is the next step, which is, have an AI observe single individuals and give us direct feedback into the system. Um, and that's uh, what we do with FISH. So it's uh, one of those things that we, you, what we can do with other animals than humans if we build, well, if we wanted to build a human robot, that's much harder and probably not really, um, you know, ethically doable. Uh, we do have to write big ethics uh, grants here to, to be able to do that. So the plan here is to, oops, sorry. The plan here is to have an agent that takes part in the social group and to have the agent measure some things inside the group such that the agent itself is better able to influence the group, okay? And the influence is really in a one-to-one -one relationship with, for example, this guy. And our goal is to lead the group. And the research, research that we did was this. We first asked, okay, what kind of observations could be informative? And you know, you see when that fish is jumping away from the robot, uh, it, it's basically displaying or it's basically basically communicating, I don't want to be with you. I, I don't like to be in your proximity. Yeah. And we can measure those, those movements, quantify um, the or estimate what the internal state of that animal is um, and use that basically one number. Um, to define a socially competent robot, you know, uh, like designated with this uh, adaptive kind of chameleon here. So the, the question really is, can we interact with a single fish such that we can make it go in a certain direction or in a certain uh, area of the, of the tank by saying, if the fish was going away, showing some avoidance behavior, then let the robot become um, a little slower, a little less direct, and then see if this um, ad ad adaptation really um, helps in convincing other animals. And we compare that to robots that really don't adapt at all. So we can program the robot to be almost uh, always um, average kind of um, direct and average slow, um, but it never adapts. It never uses the behavior of the individual, um, which could be, you know, could be the individual could be very slow or could be very fast, could be very... Um, timid or very outgoing, but the robot here in this case wouldn't adapt at all. <coughs> and this is a, a real-time feedback loop. 
And what we see is that it is actually working. The social competence that we implemented in the robot is really more attractive. Um, so looking at uh, all these orange lines here over time, everything that goes up basically means the fish is going closer to the robot. Everything that goes down means uh, the robot, sorry, the fish is going away from the robot. The orange um, is the social competent robot and the blue is the, is the like uh, non-adaptive one. And we see that even the non-adaptive ones are followed uh, on average, but yeah, it's uh, way much better um, to be a socially competent robot. Now, socially uh, competent uh, AIs are also more efficient. Um, just looking at, at this graph here, I'm going to jump over this. So this graph shows us how many trials of approaching a fish did the robot take and need to be actually able to um, recruit the fish to some certain point in, in the tank. And so the, the median here is uh, very low compared to a very high median. Uh, very inefficient, yeah? many, many approaches for the, for the static, for the non-adaptive robot. So we can discuss that later. Uh, what does it really mean for the fish? But it's just a, uh, an example of how I think AI will be um, communicating and interacting with us. It will, um, it will, you know, make a step or send us a message and see how we react. And from how we react. It will be able to understand what kind of animal, sorry, what kind of human we are. Uh, are we uh, extrovert or introvert? Are we uh, social or asocial, right? All these things can be done with uh, AIs interacting with humans. And I think also technical systems either working together or working with um, non-technical systems can be can be designed like that. And we have different uh, examples for this kind of approach uh, in the bees, uh, in the bee world as well. So this example to the right here is a, a dancing bee robot. So this um, system is used to, or can be used to send bees to a certain location they have never been to. Also the robot was never there just by um, using what we know about the, the communication between um, bees um, to inject knowledge into the system. So that one bee that you just saw here may fly to that source, will collect food from there as well, bring it back and dance. So we actually have an explosion of dances, although nobody actually was there uh, in the first place, in the, in the beginning. Um, and the the other way around um, it could also be, um, um, you know, the other way around could also uh, work to um, prevent bees from going to places they should not go. For example, if we read automatically dances that point to a certain food source that has been uh, treated with pesticides, we probably should want to stop these dances. And we have developed uh, with a few partners um, a system that vibrates the comb um, and stops dances. So this black uh, curve here shows you um, when it's going down, the motion of the, of the hive uh, is, is going down. So they're all stopping. Sometimes the dances don't really stop, but we stop the receivers of the message like here, um, and reduce the, the outbound flights, for example, reduce, um, you know, theoretically, we haven't tested that uh, pesticide um, uh, poisoning, okay? And obviously, there are many uh, examples in, in the real world, but really not that many in the physical uh, world. Most most of, ex of these examples are, uh, apps in the internet. Like for example, um, your, your timeline on Twitter is basically a function of what you have been seeing, yeah? Or um, uh, uh, recommender systems that know what you bought 
uh, um, and then recommend you buying other things that you may want to buy. Uh, there is a little bit um, uh, of this biohybrid approach already. So uh, when we ride self-driving cars, for example, um, obviously this hasn't a direct effect on our behavior, but it gives us time to, for example, go back on Twitter or buy things on Amazon uh, because we don't have to drive. Yeah, so these things already influence our world and our our behavior, and I think it makes sense to um, to uh, yeah, I guess make up our minds uh, if this is something we would like to do or not, or uh, how to improve things. Uh, I think this is coming anyway. Um, but um, let's go to the next uh, step, the third step. So far, I've sh shown you things that um, are basically AI observations of single individuals in the in the group, uh, and then some interactions, some feedback into um, it, you know either just one animal uh, of the group or a few animals. Um, what if the AI could be um, or could use everything that it that it knows on the on the entire group? And I think this isn't something that we see in in the world right now or in our technical systems. Um, but I do have an example of this in the B world. Uh, so again, in this data set here, we know exactly um, so then the IDs of every bee. Um, we know the position, uh, the orientation on the um, on the surface. We know whether bees inspect cells and or whether they are turned around. Um, we also know their behavior. So this, these vibration behaviors, dancing behaviors, all these things. So we know the interaction network, which is basically a huge matrix or a tensor, like a three-dimensional uh, matrix, saying who is doing uh, a certain interaction with whom. Yeah, And so this data set so uh, these videos and tracks are basically used to just generate these huge tensors. Um, and these tensors <clears throat> basically represent all the social behavior here. And then we can ask for things like, okay, what kind of clusters do we see in the way how animals interact? We don't need to focus on just one time point or one hour. We can just take their whole lives. So we can basically say, what kind of life paths do we see uh, in these societies? And we found many um, different things. And one of those things I find really remarkable because I don't understand it yet. Um, so in bees, usually what determines the task of an individual is, um, is age. So if you're young, you're doing um, duties inside the hive. And if you're old, um, you're tasked with, you know, um, foraging, so collecting food or um, guarding the entrance, for example. <clears throat> and so here we took a group of 123 bees and they emerged on the same day. So they're the same age and should be doing all the same. Um, but they don't. Uh, through the method that, uh, that we proposed, tracking everyone, you know, detecting all these different behaviors, we saw that... Um, over time, um, their task, which is something that I'm not explaining here, but uh, we basically extract one number, and the number is high if they're functionally old. So if they are doing old tasks, like being a forger or guarding nest entrances. Uh, we, we saw that although, like textbook says, uh, they should be doing this on day 21, there was a group within um, these 123 bees that became old earlier and we don't know why yeah and then there's another group that kind of becomes old older um, like the textbook says and then there's another group that just doesn't want to yet get uh, you know grow old and just stays um, with young tasks so <clears throat> obviously there is no feedback yet uh, I would love to use any you know direct real-time feedback to understand who are these uh, these bees but taking this biological um, example and extrapolating what we can do with this, um, 
Um, just two, two examples here. Um, optimizing wind parks is usually done by, um, you know, optimizing each individual um, wind turbine. But what if the global output, the global production can be increased even by finding suboptimal individual wind turbine settings? So, for example, because of certain airflows or um, um, irregular whatever, uh, I forgot the name, sorry. Um, the uh, right so the the let's for example say this this wind turbine here could be not turned fully into the wind but just 10 degrees left and that enables the wind flow to uh generate more power or the whole wind park to extract more power out of that wind um and that is something um that um, a company is doing that i work with um tobit um, I think it's a, it's a, it's a, I mean it's not a new idea I think but it really hasn't been done because um, you know has been people have been able to do it even without to a, 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 an okay kind of degree but I think there's there's a couple more percent coming out of this approach. Another example is how we navigate in our cities. So we all use Google Maps or Apple Maps or one of those. Um, um, app providers or navigation providers, um, but what if each of these um, feedbacks that we get from the AI, from the system, is tailored to ourselves? So to the car that we drive, to the way we drive the car, um, you know, just to match our preferences and also to globally or citywide distribute the traffic such that it, overall um, we have a more optimal flow. I think um, sometimes Google sends me in different um, routes uh, through the city, and I think this may be an experiment right now. Um, but the, the crucial part here is that it's really hard to predict um, outcomes of manipulations. Um, AIs need a lot of data, and for some like dynamical modes in which these complex systems run, we simply don't have yet data. Um, <clears throat> okay, maybe let's conclude um, this talk by looking at these uh, just last time today, um, because they have something that's really smart, and that's um, uh, something that's called truffle axis. So they share food, nectar, for example, from um, is like a part of their of their intestines that's called the social stomach. So there's just a little bit of storage for nectar for the others, and um, so it's it's like this. Um, there's a there's a bee coming back home. She didn't find anything. She was supposed to collect nectar, but she didn't find any nectar. So she could be running into the hive, but she doesn't. Um, she just begs someone outside. And that someone outside may have something, um, you know, regurgitates a little drop of nectar, uh, which gives the arriving bee energy to get back to find some, some nectar somewhere else. And that isn't a very, very tiny optimization for the individual bee, but we know we have tens of thousands of bees in a, in a colony sometimes. And these little optimization, optimizations that save maybe a minute or maybe two minutes for an individual bee, that made an impact on the rate of survival for bees in evolution. And that's why they have the system. Yeah, And so why don't we use that for something that's um, coming up in the next years. So electric cars, for example, they all have a problem, which is basically this um, <laughs> this long uh, um, line here, the red line, they have to be immobile to be able to drive. Yeah. So we have to um, put gas in our um, normal cars uh, still, but that takes a minute and charging them takes I don't know, 30 minutes, 40 minutes uh, at least. Yeah, So that's really a problem. Um, and so why can't we solve that problem the B way? 
So this is how I think this could be solved. Uh, when we go from point A to point B, and we have already a self-driving car, those cars know exactly when they start driving and when they will be in a certain point in time and, uh, and place. Yeah? Obviously, that prediction uh, gets noisier and noisier the, the further it is away in time. But what we could be doing is we could ask, okay, who else is sharing that route um, and these routes may not really have to be long, could be just a minute or so of a drive, not, not as long as this one here. Um, right? So we could like collect 10, 20 different cars that do have some energy left, that will, will be sharing some piece of our journey, and then we could just um, connect to them. Um, either really like physically, galvanically, or like in this video here, uh, these are model cars that my group built uh, via uh, inductive coupling. So whenever there's light going, uh, there's um, an energy being transferred. It's not uh, transferred now, but it should be coming. Yeah, there it is. And you could use that to not fully charge, obviously, your, your car, but to give it a little energy snack that just uh, is sufficient to, to arrive. Uh, at your destination. And so let me conclude my talk. Um, collective intelligence oftentimes, especially in human societies, feels like collective um, stupidness, yeah? Uh, like in this scenario here. But I think the way we look at it and the way we design our systems, our infrastructure, our technical, um, uh, our technical systems, the way we design these, you know, having in mind our own swarm-like organization of, of humankind, but also taking into account things that we know already work in other species that may give us um, a hint of how to transform ourselves to also uh, use our swarm-like um, uh, collective uh, behavior to something that gives us an advantage, like for example, here charging uh, ourselves. Um, and with that, I'm going to con conclude my talk. Thanks uh, so much for the invitation. I leave you with a little um, with a little video here of um, um, a pendulum, a double pendulum that starts six times in the same position, and that is really not a very complex system. But in the end, it turns out to um, enter different trajectories. And uh, it just shows us how really hard it is to predict a complex system with many, many more parts like in the honeybee colony, um, just by looking at one data sample, um, which means in the future, we will have to record really much, much more data just to be able to, to predict where the system is going. OK, thank you. <coughs> thank you very much. Thank you so much for this very interesting talk and your insights uh, and the, the journey that you took us along in, from the scientific point of view, so to speak. Uh, we thank have you. received a couple of questions from the audience, which I would like to pass on to you. Uh, so the first one is, um, is it possible to say whether there are certain factors, like key factors, that make swarm intelligence work? Yeah, I think in the beginning of the talk, I already mentioned uh, most of them. So the key factors um, in biological swarms are really diversity, the, the decentral control, um, the way they adapt. Um, I think if, you, if we have technical systems, um, <coughs> excuse me. Um, we often see that even though we try to make them all the same, we never manage to, you know, perfectly build them the same. Uh, if we look at robots, for example, um, even, you know, um, if we have indus industrial uh, manufactured ones, they all are a little different. And I think it makes sense to look at them or look at the diversity as a source of strength. Mm -hmm. um, even... 
you know, celebrate a little bit that they are different. And um, in, in swarm robotics, so a field that uh, my field is connected to, um, people are trying to just say, okay, uh, you're like that. Uh, let, let's see, you know, let's organize a swarm so we can leverage your strengths. And I think it's a very modern idea. Yeah, thank you very much. I like the idea of uh, diversity as a source of strength, right? Yeah. Uh, another question that we received is, where do you see risks in using swarm intelligence in the IoT world? Yeah, I guess um, a question that I always receive is um, whether it's a good idea to really use decentral uh, um, um, control. Um, but the answer is, well, I guess I can understand humans, and especially if we have critical infrastructure or like, I don't know, planes or, you know, if, if we have these um, flying taxis or mm -hmm. so, right? If we have swarms of flying taxis, well, yeah, people could die. Probably better to have central control. But again, it may be better to leave some control of, you know, on some level to those vehicles themselves because they are faster in observing and acting uh, than a central um, control entity would be able to communicate to them what they should be doing. It's much more robust um, if things you know, go wrong, if you have a server crash or whatever. So I think, um, um, you know, in contrast to biological swarms who just had to use um, evolution, you know, to be what they are, to become what they are, we can build uh, systems just the way we, we want them to be. We can uh, combine decentralized and centralized control. So it's not a either or kind of decision we have to go uh, for. And, and so, yeah. Um, All right. So you, you don't always need the queen bee as a central uh, point of uh, organization, right? No, 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 no. I think... I mean, even even in, uh, in in our bee colonies, right? So the the queen is just there for laying eggs. Yeah. There's no control she's actually uh, exerting on the others. But um, you know, I think even in human uh, in, in human society, right? So we do have a mix of centralized and decentralized control. I mean, yes, there is a government and there are rules and everything. But obviously, it's uh, it's really hard to make everyone follow um, those rules or even like have a control. I know make everyone look right now mm -hmm. yeah? or like uh, lift their hands. That's not going to happen. So the, the control you exert on, on your um, units has to find a certain level. And below that level, you have decentralized control, I think. Um, that makes sense. All right. Some autonomy right, on the individuals um, so they can communicate, they can do whatever they they want uh, organize themselves, and if you um, if you want them to do something, you can still control them, but you don't have to control every little piece and, and step that they do. Okay, thank you so much. I would like to conclude with a question from my side. Um, mm -hmm. With uh, PSNX technology, we follow up on the strong belief that one plus one uh, does not equal two, but it adds up to more. Um, we are the uh, we are convinced that you know in order to keep up with the ever changing times with the rapid changing environment, uh, you need to build up on swarm intelligence. You need to build up a strong community with strong partners with experts in their fields. Um, what's your opinion on it? Um, how, what do you think? Where does it take us from here? Where do we go with swarm intelligence in the industrial environment? I think it's a smart move, um, you know, celebrating the, the swarm idea. Um, I have um, seen that people are a little uh, hesitant to like to to implement anything swarm like, but <clears throat> again, swarms are everywhere. Everything is a networked system in the end, and I think um, the the world is opening up to these more complex um, views on. Um, org organizations and organize, uh, organizing technical systems. Um, you know, your community of developers, for example, if you organize them as a swarm um, with flat hierarchies, that's, that's I think, a very smart. I think this is, we have learned in the workspace, you know, we have learned 
that the world probably needs that much more than any, you know, old fashioned kind of control of workers that uh, gives you freedom, that gives you flexibility, that, that creates creativity. Um, and I think, you know, if you start there, um, open up the, the like, even the, the the brains of those who decide what like what kind of paths to follow. Um, we will see uh, network systems and uh, decentral controlled systems, um, systems that will adapt to <clears throat> the different environmental um, requirements, you know. Um, and um, yeah, I think looking at nature and looking at methods that we can copy, uh, it would be stupid not to, you know. <laughs> right, exactly. Yeah, today we learned a lot what to copy. Um, so we will both follow up on uh, how everything will develop, right? So thank you very much for this uh, insightful presentation today. Yeah, we're approaching the end of this session now. Um, I hope you enjoyed the B note just as much as I did. Um, I will close for now. I will say goodbye. Say goodbye to Berlin. Thanks for joining today. And say goodbye to you. Bye. Wishing you a great day. Saying thank you for your attention and for your time. And see you next time. Bye-bye.